we're going to set up a firewall, so create some rules for a firewall, and the software we'll use is called IP Tables, and we're going to do it in a virtual network. So the first thing that we need to do is create that virtual network. So we'll go through those steps, and then we'll use and introduce IP Tables. To create the virtual network, several steps. We're going to create this network which looks like this. It's going to have five computers, five nodes. One will be the router. And in fact, for IP tables, I think we'll just use one, and, uh, one three, and four for most tasks. Uh, but we'll create that, and we'll use VN create topology seven. But before we do that, we need to set things up and check that everything will work. So you've got internet access. So first, open VirtualBox. So from the menu, open the, the, the GUI for VirtualBox. Click on that. And just check, because someone may have used these computers before, there may be some nodes that exist. You should see just base. If so, leave it there. If you see other nodes, delete them. Sorry? If I see node 1, I will delete that. And I'll delete all files. So you should have base, and base should be powered off. You should have no nodes there. We'll close that. We don't need that. We'll use the command line to manipulate the virtual machines. So with VirtualBox, you can use the GUI to create virtual machines and open them, or you can use the command line. And that's what we'll do. So first we need to just update our programs to, to create the topology. So CD into the directory, you should have SVN VertNet. There's only three or four commands. Uh, and press enter. Success. And then just type SVN update. And press enter. It just downloads some files that uh, are necessary to uh, create our topology. And it should say updating. It may be different on some of the computers. It may download two or three files. It may take a, a, a minute or so. Make sure you have internet access for that to work, of course. That's the part where we needed internet access. It downloads from a server some, some new files that we'll use. Once you've done that, cd into the directory bin slash host. This can this directory contains the, the program to create our topology for us. And now create the topology. Bash, VN, create topology, and we're creating topology number seven. That's the topology that of those five nodes. So it's just be careful, it's wrapped around there. And press enter, and it should take a few minutes to create that topology. Just let it run.
and I'll create. It should go through all those steps. Of, it just creates those five VirtualBox machines. It takes a few minutes. If, if you didn't catch the commands I typed, they're in the, in the file ITS-335 notes. Okay, so the file ITS-335 notes contains those commands that I just did. So I suggest having that open so you can see. What that's doing is creating five nodes and connecting them in the network topology that we desire. While that's running, because we want to access all five nodes at the same time, I suggest you open another five terminals. Okay, so we're going to have five nodes plus the original host, so open another five new terminals. So open five more and eventually we'll log in for those five separate ones so we can do things uh, on each of those nodes at the same time. So open some more terminals and you may want to use your workspaces. This, this icon, the workspace switcher, allows you to switch between the, the workspaces or the desktops really that allows you to have a little bit more space when you have those five terminals open. So in my case, where I only have a, a smaller screen, I'm going to switch between the desktops. So I've got a number of terminals open. And I'm going to make mine different colors so we can distinguish between those five nodes. So you should have six terminals open. One, it's, it's creating the topology now. And the other five we'll use in a moment once the topology is created. A shortcut to switch between desktops is Control, Alt, and the arrow keys. Control key, Alt key, and the arrows will switch between. Let's look. While it's still running, let's look at what we're going to do in this task. So the homework, several tasks. We're just going to do some basics of adding firewall rules and we're using the software IP tables. And the first task will be to understand the difference between what we call the input forward and output chains. So on the presentation, uh, it gives some information about IP tables. And the way to think of it, and some details, from your computer's perspective, packets come into the network interface card, come into the operating system or the Linux kernel, and then they may be filtered. A firewall filters packets. A filter either usually accepts or drops them. And if they're accepted, those packets go to the applications. So IP tables we use to control the filters for what goes through to the applications. And the same in the other direction. IP tables has some treats the set of filters in different what's called tables. And we're only using what's called the filter table today, the default option. But more importantly, it contains what it calls chains. So let's explain that. And the picture maybe explains it the easiest. Think from your computer. People can send packets to your computer. Your computer can send packets out. Or if your computer is a router, your pa computer can forward those packets through to someone else. So IP tables allows us to treat those three types of packets separately. And that's done performed using the three chains called the input chain, the output chain, and the forward chain. When we refer to the input chain, it refers to only the packets that are going to your computer, into your computer. Output chain refers to the packets that are created by com your computer and go out. And the forward chain is for packets that are going through your computer if you're a router only. 
Note that a, a packet that goes through your computer actually comes in and out again, but it's treated separately under this what's called forward chain. The main reason we need to know this is because IP tables allows you to create separate rules for each of those ch chains. You can create a rule for the input chain only, or the output chain only, or for all of those chains. And those rules will only be applied to the packets which are either coming in, going out, or being forwarded. Normally we'll run a firewall on a router and the, the chain of interest is forward chain. So normally we deal with forwarding and most of the tasks today will be about using the forward chain. So we'll not deal much with the others. Uh, there are other chains but they are not going to be used uh, for our firewall today. Pre-routing and post-routing are used for things like changing packets, modifying packets. Our firewall in a simplest term will either drop or allow packets. But it can do more complex things like modify packets and that's where pre-routing and post-routing chains come in into play. So just remember input, packets coming to, into your computer. Output, packets created by your computer going out. Forward, if your router, packets going through. How are we going? Has everyone got their topology created? I'm up to node 4. It's slow because of different reasons. One is the, the logging in to secure shell is takes some time in checking. We need to set that up a bit better. So once you've got those five nodes created, we'll use them. While well, we're waiting, the first task, we will add a rule to the firewall table. So we, what we do is the firewall administrators create rules. And we add them to the filter table because we want to filter packets. And the, the aim of the first rule is to block ping from working. We all know that ping uses the protocol ICMP. So what we'll do is we'll create a rule that will drop ICMP packets. And the first rule will be drop packets being forwarded by between the two, not submits, subnets. I must have wrote that a little bit too quick. Subnets. Because in our network, we'll run the firewall on node 3. Node 3 will be the firewall. So what we want to do is stop, say, computer 1 from pinging computer 4. So we'll add a rule that node 3, the router and the firewall, will drop ICMP packets. And we're almost there on mine. I hope some of yours are finished being created. If they are, then on your five other terminals, so mine's just finished, you, sh you can check in VirtualBox you should see node 1 to 5 powered off. We don't use the GUI, we don't need it. Now I'll go to my other terminals and I'll log in to those nodes. I'll actually start them and log in and the shortcut for doing that vn slash ssh and then the node number. So on one terminal vn ssh 1 what it does is starts the node and then logs in automatically for us. And do that on the other terminals for the other four nodes. It takes some time. This one for me is node 3. So that VNSSH program just starts the node, it boots the computer and then eventually logs in. And you should see them all logged in and you get the prompt logged into each of those five nodes. 
and I'll just clear on each of them. So I now have my five nodes running. I have terminals and logged into each of them. So we'll start uh, setting things up for our firewall. So we want to add a rule on the firewall and the firewall will be on node three to block say nodes one and two from pinging four and five and also in the opposite direction. So first let's just ping and see if it works. And note the IP addresses of these nodes. They all start with 192.168. And then the first subnet is dot one. Node one is dot one dot eleven. Node two one dot twelve. The nodes four and five are subnet one nine two one six eight two dot twenty one two dot twenty two. And the router is on both subnets. So first we'll just check that ping works. So in node 1, I'm going to ping, say, node 4. Just three pings, a count of three. Ping 192.168.2.21. And we should get a response. Just to check that your network is working. If it's not, then we have a problem. Now, on our router, in my case the white one, node 3, let's add a rule to drop ICMP. And we'll use the command, it's IP tables. To modify the firewall, we need to be administrator, so we'll use sudo always with IP tables. And the syntax, after some practice, it becomes quite easy. We want to add a rule, dash uppercase A, let's add a rule to the table and we need to specify the chain. We're the router, so we mainly deal with the forwarding chain. Add a rule to the forward chain, so if it applies only the packets that are going to go through my computer. Forwarded. And now we specify the conditions. What are the conditions we want? What packets should we drop? Ping packets, and how do we identify ping packets? The protocol minus P is ICMP. So minus P specifies the, the transport protocol. So the common options we'll see is ICMP, TCP, or UDP. If it's ICMP, we don't care about the source or destination. So we will not specify the source or destination. We don't care about port numbers. They're not relevant for ICMP. So if it's ICMP, then we take some action and the syntax we jump to some operation so minus j we jump to some operation to drop those packets add a rule to the forward chain the conditions are that the packets must be using the protocol ICMP and if that condition matches we will drop those packets Try it. We, we prompted for the network password, which is network. And then test. See if you can ping. So our firewall seemed to work. And that at least node one cannot ping node four in my case. Three packets were transmitted, zero received. So the rule in this case, anything that was ICMP that was going through my router, I dropped it. I didn't allow it through.
See if you can ping from node 1 to the, to the other nodes. So we ping from node 1 to node 4. What about to node 5, which is 2.22? So we're on node 1. See if you can ping node 5. Yes or no? Why not? Because our firewall drops it. And then try see if you can ping node 2. Okay, we cannot ping node 5, the 2.22. Ping node th 2, which is 1.12. Yes, we can ping node 2 because the packets don't go via the router. They're on the same subnet. So this is a case of, think of an internal computer talking to another internal computer. The firewall doesn't take any part in that communications. Can you ping node 3? Try to ping node 3. Why can you ping node 3? Because we applied the rule to the forward chain. So here's the case that I'm pinging, and we'll come back to our network diagram. I'm pinging, so we saw the ping from node 1 to node 4 didn't work. The firewall blocks it. From 1 to 5 didn't work. The firewall blocks the packet. Good. 1 to 2 works because we don't go via the firewall. We just go via the switch. So we can ping 1 to 2. Pinging, so here net A, although there's no actual switch in our network, VirtualBox thinks we can think of that's a switch that connects them. So there's a cable going from node 1 into the switch and the switch into the router, node 3. So 1 to 2 works. 1 to 3 also works because the packet that comes from 1 to 3 is going into computer 3. It's not being forwarded by computer 3. Therefore, it's only we apply the rules and the input chain to that packet, which we didn't add a rule to. Can computer 3 ping computer 4? Try it. Try. Can node 3 ping node 4? Don't. So here we can test and uh, confirm what we believe will happen. Node 3 to node 4? Yes. Why? Because it's not forwarding that packet, it's outputting the packet. Okay, so that's the difference between input, output and forward. And we can s see the rules to switch three. So we added, added a rule to the forward chain. Let's look at the rules. We can use IP tables to list the rules. Minus L will list the rules. And I'll zoom out a bit so it will fit in. Pseudo IP tables minus L should show you the rules in the input chain. There are none. In the forward chain, there is one rule. That's the one we added. In the output chain, there are none. Remember our firewall, we can think of as a table. Each row specifies a rule. The output also shows us here that the default of our firewall is to accept. Anything that's not in the table will accept. Anything that doesn't match the rules. 
we can see it in the raw form using the minus n option to see the actual addresses. So looking closer at the forward chain, just at the forward chain, ignoring the other two, it gives us some summary information. If the protocol is ICMP, if the source is anywhere, destination anywhere, then if our packet matches those conditions, then take the action. The target is to drop that packet. We can delete the rule. using the exact same syntax as adding the rule but minus D instead of minus A. There are other ways to delete but that's one way. Just same as adding but minus D. So delete the rule. Now add a rule to the input chain. The input chain on our router means the packets that come into our router. So now we have a rule only in the input chain no rules in forward or output. So this rule will only apply to packets that are sent to my router. Now test ping. See who can ping who. Can node 1 ping node 4? Can node 1 ping node 3? Can node 3 ping node 4? Try those three cases. Node 1 to 4, 1 to 3, and 3 to 4. Node 1 can ping node 4 because that ping, ping packet is forwarded by the router. We created a rule to only handle the packets which go into the router, not forwarded. So the firewall is not blocking this ping packet. The firewall is only blocking ping packets to the router. So if we try to ping the router, what happens? From node 1 to node 3, the packet's coming into the router and the rule should drop that packet. What about router to node 4? Try to ping from your router to node 4, for example. Why not? Have you done something wrong? So from node 3 to node 4. We saw that one could ping node 4 because the firewall rule is only applying to packets which are coming into node 3. So forwarding is okay, accepted. One could not ping node 3 because of the input rule drops that packet. Can node 3 ping node 4? No, why not? We didn't change the output rule. 
Node 3 can send a ping request to Node 4, but will not receive the reply. The reply from 4 back to 3 comes into Node 3. So therefore that gets dropped. So with many applications, when they request response-based applications, if we drop one of the two, the application won't work. Here we're dropping the reply. So really we just need to drop either the request or the reply. So in this case it's dropping the reply. Let's look at our firewall uh, tables again. Let's clear the firewall table. So let's delete the rule that's there. And a quick way to delete is to flush minus F. We can flush a specific chain. Flush means delete all. So a quick way to, to clear out the firewall rules is to flush the, the table. So the input forward and output chains are all empty and the default policy is accept. Let's look at the next task. Add a rule to the firewall table to prevent node 1 from secure shelling to outside nodes. So think of node 1 and node 2 is inside, node 4 and 5 outside. Stop node 1 from SSH into the outside nodes. Let's just check before we add the rule that we can. Node 1, secure shell into node 4 for example. Secure shell gives us a remote access to that computer. It's slow because it does some uh, host name or DNS lookups trying to t determine if it's uh, who it's connecting to. But because they're in the virtual network, it's not uh, responding. So eventually it logs into node 4. We've set up these nodes so that they automatically log in. You don't need a password. Okay, so just to make it easier for the moving between the nodes, because they're all the same password network, I've set it up just so it's auto login. So I secured shell into node 4. Let's exit, log out. I'm back to node 1. We'll do that again in a moment, but let's first add a rule to stop that from working. I want to stop node 1 to be able to secure shell into node 4 and also node 5. Add a rule. What chain are we going to do it on? We want to stop at the firewall, node 1, from accessing outside computers. The firewall is a router, and we're mainly going to use the forward chain in this case. Apply the rules to packets going through the router. What conditions do we want? How do we find the secure shell packets? Port number will be important. Before that, what protocol does Secure Shell use? What transport protocol? TCP. And specifically, we can identify usually applications by port numbers. What's the port number of a Secure Shell server? A web server we know is port 80, a Secure Shell server. It's so the destination port, so dash dash is a special option, destination port, 
22. So this is an extra condition. If the protocol is TCP and if the destination port number is 22, because we know that the secure shell server will be listening on port 22, what other conditions do we want? Drop is the action, but there may be another condition that we should specify. The, the, the aim, prevent node 1 from secure shelling into any outside nodes. So in our simple network, we want to stop node 1 from secure shelling to 4 or 5 or anyone else who may be outside. But we don't want to stop node 2. So we should specify the source. If the source is node 1, they're trying to connect to a secure shell server, then drop that. Let's find our router. So we'll add another condition. Dash S for source. And it's going to wrap around. Specify the source address. Node 1's address. We know Secure Shell uses TCP and the server listens on port 22. So if it's coming from node 1 to a Secure Shell server, jump to the action of drop. Add the rule, you may check. List the rules. And this is where we should use the minus n option to avoid this lookup. It does a lookup for, it for trying to find, does the IP address have an actual domain name? And it takes a long time. So it says, there's a rule now, protocol TCP, if the source is node 1, if the destination is anywhere, if the destination port is secure shell, then drop it. Let's try. Go back to node 1 and see if we can secure shell again. And you shouldn't be able to. Okay. If you can, maybe your rules are not working correct. Let's, let's see some details of what's happening there. Eventually the secure shell, uh, so it's trying to connect, it's sending the packets, node 3 is receiving them, but dropping them. Let's check that, so I'll, I'll control C to stop, it didn't work for me, we'll try it again in a moment. But let's capture packets on node 3 and see the packets coming in. We can use TCP dump to capture. Coming into interface ETH1, minus N to avoid any DNS lookups and we can select just, so this is a way to filter. TCP dump shows many packets. In quotes, TCP show just the TCP packets. So we'll run TCP dump and it will show us the packets coming in. It's running. I'll just zoom out a bit so it will show on a one line. And now try secure shell. And then look at the TCP dump output. You should see some packets coming in 
to our router before they get dropped. What's happening is that TCP is retransmitting. And it tries multiple times before it gives up. Let's have a look. On my case, I'll just highlight the first packet. I see node 1 connecting to the secure shell server. So look at the, the TCP packets. Look at the times. Do you see any pattern? Let's see the packets. They're all from my node 1, 192.168.1.11, going to the secure shell server on computer node, node 4 port 22. So the syntax we see the IP address dot port number. The flag S here means what? What's the first TCP packet? S is for when we use TCP we establish a connection. So we send a SYN packet. So this is the SYN packet being sent from my computer to the server. But it gets to the firewall it's received by the router, but then the firewall drops it. So in fact, this packet will not get to node 4. You could have captured on node 4 and see that it doesn't arrive. Then a short time later, my computer sends a SYN packet again. Same destination. Because it didn't get a reply, it retries. Send a SYN packet. We're expecting a SYN ACK. We don't get one. So send another SYN packet. We're expecting a SYN ACK, so after some time, retry. And it keeps retrying. How, how often did it retry? Well, the first one was at 9.56, 17 seconds. One second later, it retried. Two seconds later. Four seconds later. 8 seconds, 16 seconds later, and you see the pattern. It's doubling the interval between retrying each time. Yeah. 32 seconds later, and I think the last one is 64 seconds later, and then it gives up. So we don't see another packet because we eventually got this error message saying could, cannot connect, the connection timed out. So this is just showing how the connection uh, works with respect to retries. We keep trying to connect but it won't connect because we know that the firewall is dropping this packet. It never gets to the destination. Any questions before we move on to some other rules? Let me find our other tasks. Let's try task three where we access instead of secure shell server, web server. 
and we'll do it and uh, learn a little bit about HTTP along the way. Nodes 4 and 5 are already running web servers. So we've set them up so that they r run web servers. Well, they, we need to start the web server. So to start the web server, we'll run this command. The web server software is called Apache 2, and we can start it using this uh, service command, uh, start the Apache 2 service, and we'll do it on nodes 4 and 5. Just one of them is enough, but let's do it on both. So start the web server on node 4. sudo service apache2 start. It, starting web server gives this warning. Don't worry about it. It's just that this web server doesn't have a real domain name. That's all. It's just we haven't set up a domain name uh, on this web server. So it's using just a, a, its special name for the server name. Do the same on node 5, although we may not use that today. So again, the web server should be running on 4 and 5. Come back to my firewall. I'll stop TCP dump. And let's clear our let's flush our IP tables. Just get rid of the old rules. So we we start from scratch again. So we have no rules here. Let's just check that our web server is working before we use our firewall. How are we going to access the website? So different ways. We can use links to use a, a graphical uh, a text-based web browser. So on node 1, links is a, a text-based web browser because we don't yet have a GUI on those virtual nodes. We just have the, the command line interface. We can try links. And we specify the destination address. We don't have a domain name for our web server, but we can use the IP address. For example, to access the web server on node 4, Links is the web browser and open the URL HTTP 192.168.2.21. Does it work? Okay, it brings us to the default web page. This web page was created but when we installed the web server. So the web server has a, a default web page. There's not much to see there. We'll quit. Q to quit. Are you sure you want to quit? Yes. Just to get out of there. We, later we may use that to follow some links. So we can access the web website. Uh, let's just check on the web server where that web page was, where would the web page be stored on the server? What directory? Anyone remember? Slash var slash www. Index.html. So if you want to change that default web page, you can edit you need to do it as sudo sudo nano index.html and it'll open up that the, just the default web page which is displayed by the web server it works So you can, can edit that web page. In a later uh, topic, we'll create some other web pages on our server. Now we use links to access that web page. We can use other approaches as well. 
Back to node one. So we use links. How does HTTP work? What what's the what's the messages that are sent by HTTP? A get we send a get request from browser to server. The server, when it receives a get request, sends back a response, usually containing the web page. What your web browser does is creates the get request in the right format. But we know the structure of a get request, don't we? What's a get request look like? Let's try. Let's download that web page using a different command, a simpler command, nc or netcat. Netcat creates a simple TCP connection to a server. So netcat connect to the web server and connect to the, that computer at port 80 because we know that the web server is on port 80. So we're going to do a very, very, very basic way to download the web page here using netcat instead of a browser. So netcat will create a TCP connection to computer 2.21 at port 80 and then it, if you remember netcat we can type things in. What we would type in is the actual get request. And I'll do it quite quickly because uh, that may time out if we don't send the quet request as, as fast as possible or within a, uh, some time. Let's try it and we may try it again if it doesn't work fast enough. We're connecting. Now we send a message. And the first line specifies the file to get. And we need one optional, one field that must be included. It's called the host field. And I'll explain it in a moment, but see if it worked in this case. I sent this. That is, I typed in three lines there. And I did it quick because it times out if you don't uh, send it within a, uh, a few seconds. So what we did there is we don't need a web browser to request a web page because HTTP just sends text-based messages. We can type in the GET request. So remember that a GET request starts with the word GET, followed by the web page we want to get, and then the protocol and version. So that's fixed. I know that we're using HTTP 1.1. I think most web browsers use that now. A GET request may have fields following it. And there's one field that we need to include. It's called the host field. And it's quite simply the IP address of the web server. Or if the web server has a domain name, the domain name. And then I press enter and a GET request we know it's the end of the request when we have a blank line. So I pressed enter twice. So in fact, this is the request. It was sent to port 80 on 221. And when the web server receives such a request, it sends back a reply. And the reply is my web page, including the header fields. Make sure you get yours to work. So make sure you type in the request in the exact correct format and within time. It may time out and give you some error response. If you get the URL wrong or the host wrong, it may return an error. So we're using NC just as an alternative to create a raw connection. We will create the message ourselves. We will not use a web browser to create the GET request. We will type it in. And we must type the request message in the exact right format. And, and it's, an example is given here. And it times out if we don't do it quick enough. Let's capture. And we can use TCP dump to capture. But it's quite complex command to specify capture only the HTTP messages. So I give it here. 
So it's best to copy and paste because we need to specify, let's ignore the sins, sin acts and acts, just capture the data messages. This is the command using TCP dump. So on the router, we'll capture that. So we haven't added a rule yet. We'll connect again. Still no rules. So on the router we'll start capturing with this long command. So copy and paste this so you don't get it wrong. What it does is captures packets coming into interface ETH1. Some options just to show the output in a nice format. And to port 80 and this means just get the data messages, ignore the sins and synax. And this part is redirect the output to a file. You can include that, but because I want to show it on the screen, I'll omit the last part. But you can include it, so it outputs to a text file, so you can save it yourself. So it's capturing. Now access our website again. Again, I requested the web page. I got the response. And if we look at the capture, we see a lot of messages here. They look strange, but they'll make sense. Yours, if you redirect it to http.txt, this information is saved in the text file. So you can open the text file. But I've just shown it direct on the screen. What it shows is four packets. Packet 1 being sent from my computer to the web server. Packet 2 from my computer to the web server. And packet 3 from my computer to the web server. Packet 4 is from the web server back to my computer. It shows the actual packet contents, but some of the, the values are in these strange characters because they're not printable characters. But the thing that you'll recognize is what I typed in. This is the first part of the GET request. Even though the HTTP GET request is one message, it was sent in this case in three TCP packets. Because I pressed ENTER each time. This was the first string I typed in. I pressed ENTER. The packet was sent. The next string I typed in was sent to the web server. And then the last one was a actually just a, a blank line. I press enter again. Is sent to the web server. The web server understands that, those three lines or three packets, and realizes I'm requesting index.html and the web server sends back in the, the last packet the contents of the response. So here we see the router seeing the request and response. This is not about IP tables, but in our next topic, or our topic on web security, you see that it's very easy for a router to intercept web traffic. So if you want to stop someone in, in between you and the web server from viewing your request and response, you need to use HTTPS or some other uh, security mechanisms. So let's block HTTP. Let's not. I'll, I'll leave a task for you to block HTTP. It's very easy to, to block the web request. It's similar to Secure Shell. Let's move to the last task. So you should try and create a rule to prevent the internal nodes from accessing the web server on node 4. But let's go to task, task 4 and 5, 5 especially. Task 4 is easy. Currently our firewall accepts everything. The default policy is accept. Let's change it to drop, which is more secure.
by default accept anything that doesn't match the rules. We can change the policy to drop minus p. What have I done wrong? We need to specify the, the, the chain. We can do it for all of them, but I'll just do it for forward. Because on our router, just to, so that we don't block ourselves from accessing the router, we'll just do it on forward at this stage. So anything that goes through our router now will be dropped. Let's test. Ping doesn't work from node 1 to node 4. Secure shell will not work. So this drops everything. And that's a more secure solution in that now we need to create rules to allow what we want. It means mistakes will not allow people to access things that they shouldn't. The last thing we want to do is look at stateful packet inspection. Remember that it becomes difficult to add rules to handle packets going in both directions. So the way to deal with that is using SPI. And what we can do on our firewall is enable SPI. It's not enabled by default, we need to turn it on so that the firewall will automatically add entries to the SPI table that will accept packets which have been accepted by the firewall rules. So we'll do it and then we'll see the impact. So in IP tables, the way to enable stateful packet inspection is this special command. We add a f to the forward chain. What we do is we want to maintain state. Keep track of the connections which have been established or related to established connections and automatically accept them. So this is a special command with IP tables that really enables stateful packet inspection. So let's turn it on. Let's run that command. I'll copy and paste. This r means anything that's going through my firewall and if the packets are related to an existing or an established TCP connection, then I'll accept them automatically. So we, as the administrator, don't have to handle those rules. So all we need to do now is allow the first packet through. So let's say we want to allow uh, secure shell access. Currently, I cannot secure shell into computer 21. Let's add a rule so that we can. Add to the forward chain a rule, secure shell, remember, protocol TCP, destination port 22. If we want to control the direction and allow, say, the internal nodes to access out, but not the external nodes to access in, we can specify other options like minus I for the input interface. Maybe back to our picture of the router. We'll come back to the command just to remind us. Router 3, the internal network on the left, we think of node 1 and 2 as inside, 4 and 5 outside. We want to allow, say, node 1 to secure shell out but not allow 4 to secure shell in. So we want to allow packets that are coming on the input interface ETH1. If it comes to the router in via ETH1, then allow it. But if it's coming in to interface ETH2, then don't allow it. So we'll specify the interface as another option here.
If the packet is going through our router, if it arrived on the input interface ETH1, means if it arrived from an internal computer, if it's using TCP and it's going to a secure shell server, then accept the packet. Let's test. See if you can secure a shell from node 1 to node 4. And it does some lookup and eventually it should log us in. It's slow because it tries to find the corresponding domain name. Now I'm logged into node 4. So I, I successfully SSH from node 1 to node 4. The firewall allowed that. The reason because of two things. This rule allows that first packet from the node 1 to node 4 to be accepted. And then, because we enabled SPI, Stateful Packet Inspection, because the first packet is, ex is accepted, the firewall automatically accepts all subsequent packets related to that connection. So the reply, the SYNAC, and all the data messages using that combination of port numbers and uh, IP addresses means that they will be automatically accepted. Just list our rules. So we've got two rules. One is about stateful packet inspection and one was for secure shell. The last thing we'd like to do is to view the entries of the SPI table. It's not normally available via IP tables. We need some other software to view the connections that are currently established. And We'll install the software to do that on the router, software called Contract for Connection Tracker. So on the router, run this command, sudo apt-get install contract. Install some software that allow us to view the connections. Yes to install. and let it install. Does it install? Anyone? I think these these computers are set up to use the wrong server here, trying to connect to this server and it will not connect. So let's not install that software. Control C. We'll try that another day. That connect contract software allows us to view the SPI table. We can't do that with IP tables. I forgot to set up the correct uh, connection there, the connect correct server. So let's recap on what we've done. The first rule here, and it's split across, across two lines, is really to say use stateful packet inspection. And if you remember from our lectures, stateful packet inspection, the firewall automatically records connections that have been accepted so that we as the administrator don't have to manually add rules to handle subsequent packets. So all we need to do is add a rule to handle the first packet. So here what we said is for the TCP packet going to the secure shell server, accept that. And any response for that, the SPI table will accept that as well. If you want to see the details of those rules, because it only shows a, a short summary, add the minus V option. 
it gives us some more information about some statistics and says that uh, the number of packets which have been accepted, for example. As you do things, you'll see that there was one packet accepted via this rule and there's been 54 packets accepted by the SPI table. Those packets are being accepted when I do something on, on node 4 using the secure shell connection and then I exit. And more packets have been accepted in this case. The one thing that we didn't get to do is to see the actual connections, to see the contents of the SPI table. We'll try and demonstrate that uh, at a later stage. <laughs>